Good morning, First Baptist Church family and friends. I'm recording on Friday afternoon, May 29th. I'm so excited to tell you that we will be meeting at church for worship Sunday, May 31st at 1030. However, the deacons and trustees and your pastors are making every effort to accommodate those who may not feel like they can come out yet because of COVID-19 or those who are um, shut-ins and also our friends and family from other states. We have been blessed and humbled by that response. Um, in an effort to continue to provide YouTube with a recording of our service, we have purchased and received, in fact, we received it today, a camera that may allow us to even upload our services live. So I don't know yet. And um, Pastor Brandon and I need to work on that so to see if we um, can upload live or if we'll have to make a recording and then sometime later on Sunday, it will be uploaded. Uh, we're just not sure about the technology yet. We're all learning, and we hope to have that ready for you next Sunday. So maybe June, the first Sunday in June, we will be having our services live. We'll let you know about that. Uh, so this morning may be the last time I come to you this way in our dining room. I am humbled that you have been so faithful to follow our services or my messages, and I hope you'll enjoy our services live or a recording of them live. With that said, let's just ask God to bless our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer, we ask that you be with us. Thank you for this technology. Uh, a lot can be used for evil, but we're also uh, thankful that it can be used for the spread of your word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the faithfulness of God's people, both in gathering virtually and supporting our church financially. I pray your blessing on those who are continuing to battle with cancer. I pray for Ron Barker, and I pray for Jim Swihart. We learned this week that Connie uh, Souther has breast cancer, and uh, she will find out in a few days what the treatment will be, but they've caught it early, and it hasn't spread, and so we ask that you will bless her. And Dave, thank you for our dear, faithful uh, friends, and we ask a special blessing upon them. Father, we're thankful that uh, this morning we can meet together at our building and we pray for a blessing on that service. I ask that you would help us with the technology that we may be able to provide for those who are shut-ins and those who are not able to attend for whatever reason a live service of uh, 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 uploading a live stream service. And we just ask that that will be a blessing. Uh, we so enjoyed hearing how people were blessed by us being together virtually. Bless your word now, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Last week, we discovered that angels were revered for their power and their status by the Jewish people. They were thought even to be more powerful than the Messiah by some of the Jewish sects. Some believed that angels had to be consulted before God did anything. Uh, some believed that the angels moved the stars and advanced the days were in control of the calendar. So, beginning the theme that would carry throughout the book of Hebrews, the author states that Jesus is better 
better than even angels. He says in verse 4 that Jesus obtained a better or higher name and more excellent name than angels. Beloved, Jesus Christ is better than anyone or anything you or I could possibly imagine. The resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, is better than anyone or anything, even angels. So today we're going to finish the five reasons that the writer of Hebrews says Jesus is better than angels. We already saw the first two last week. Jesus is better than angels first because Jesus is the Son of God. That's in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. First reason that Jesus Christ is better than the angels is no angel was ever called God's son, and no angel was ever called his only begotten son. Even though they are referred to the sons of God, they are not the begotten son of God. The second reason that angels are better than, uh, that Jesus is better than angels is because Jesus is God. Verse six. And when again, he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all angels of God worship him. Uh, Jesus is God, and he is the firstborn. And we saw that last week. That refers to a title, not time. The firstborn is a title or a status. It has nothing to do with birth order. Jesus is the firstborn of creation. He is the firstborn of the dead. Today, we celebrate the resurrected Lord. It is temporal, not I mean, it is status, not temporal. So Jesus is God. And today we're going to pick up the third reason Jesus Christ is better than angels. He is better because he is the Son. He is better because he is God. And third, he is better because he is King. Look at verses 7 through 9. And of the angels, he said, Who makes his angels wins? and his ministers as flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. As kings, according to verse 7, Jesus created the angels. The writer says he made the angels. The word for makes is the Greek word to create. Uh, uh, the writer is saying Jesus created the angels. And the subject of that creation, of course, is referring to Jesus Christ. Who created angels? Jesus Christ did. Now, if Jesus created angels... He's obviously superior or better than angels. He creates angels. He is the greater because he is their creator. In chapter 1, verse 2, the writer of Hebrews says, By his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by all, him also he made the world. The word for world there is not the inhabited earth like we saw last week. This is the word aeon. We get the word eon from it. It, it. it means the universe. It means ages. It means forever. It means an unbroken time, the perpetuity of time, eternity. Jesus Christ is king of the universe and he created eternity. 
He created time and space. He made the ages. He made the universe. Jesus made the angels. So we know, first of all, they are created beings. But not only that, they were created by Jesus Christ. What kind of pronoun is his? They are, that's possessive, right? And, and he created his angels. He makes his own angels. Now, that's a quote from Psalm 104.4. And again, the writer is using the Old Testament to verify the superiority of Jesus Christ to angels. Now, Jesus Christ created the, his angels, and the writer of Hebrews says, as flames and winds as winds and flames of fire. Winds are used to describe angels because they can be invisible, powerful, rapid movement. Uh, recording this on Friday, boy, last night, we got some tremendous wind here in Rochester. Uh, angels are called wind because they're invisible and powerful like the wind. They're also called flames of fire, and that's very interesting. Not only can angels blow or, uh, uh, around like wind or, or move rapidly and invisibly, but they are powerful as flames carrying out God's bidding. Uh, now, whenever you read about God's judgment uh, in the Old Testament, a lot of times it was fire. And, and that is usually orchestrated or carried out by angels. Uh, and we see that angels meet out God's judgment on earth. Uh, we see that back in Genesis 19. That's a very familiar passage. It's about Sodom and Gomorrah. And angels were sent to destroy those awful cities because of their awful sin. The angels literally had to grab Lot and his family and pull them out of the city. Now, you remember Lot's wife was warned not to turn back and look, and she did, and was changed into a pillar of salt. So the angels appear in Genesis 19. They're God's judgments, judges, so to speak, and they brought fire and brimstone um, or at least announce God's coming fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. In Psalm 78, verse 49, the writer of Psalms says, He casts upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. God is going to judge people or does judge people by sending evil angels. Now, I don't think that means demons. I don't think it means that the angels are um, evil in their character. I think it means that they're evil in their judgment. Angels bring harsh judgment. And God sends his angels of judgment to bring God's anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble upon unrepentant men. We also learn then in the New Testament, that angels are there for judgment. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 and 42, we read this. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out all of his kingdom, all things that offend, and them who do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So the angels are God's executioner, so to speak. So here in this verse, angels are seen as when they are, are powerful, they are swift, they're invisible, but they're also angels, uh, uh, agents of judgment. Significantly, these beings, as powerful are they are, as they are, are created by Jesus Christ. They are his angels. They are possessed by him. So angels are created servants, created ministers. They do not operate on their own, 
they operate at the direction of God the Father and Jesus Christ, God the Son. So Christ created his angels, and verse 8 makes a great distinction between the fact that the angels were created and their creator, Jesus Christ. And, and here you're going to hear one of the greatest statements in all of the word of God concerning Jesus Christ as king. Verse 8 says, But to the Son, he, God the Father, says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Jesus Christ is the Son, and he is God. This couldn't be clearer. And he is king. Angels are just ministers and servants and created beings. But Jesus Christ is God. His throne lasts forever. And so you see this dynamic difference between angels and the Son because the Son is eternal God. And that's right here, beloved. Uh, you get that? I, I mean, surely you do. It's, it's pretty plain as far as the Scripture. A classic dynamic statement in the Word of God then is that Jesus Christ is God eternal. People who are going around saying that Jesus was just a man and that Jesus was one of the many angels or perhaps even the greatest angel, as some sects or cults say. Uh, some say he was a prophet of God or that Jesus was a little God, a sub-God, a demigod, an inferior God. Beloved, anyone who says that are just plain lying. They aren't telling the truth. The Bible says, and God the Father says here, that Jesus is God. Now the Father says to the th Son, your throne, O God, couldn't be much clearer, right? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. This is the Father not only acknowledging the Son as God, emphatic, powerful, irrefutable proof of the deity of Christ, and, but that his throne will last forever and ever. In John 5, verse 18, the, the Apostle John corroborates what is said here. The Jews were seeking to kill Jesus because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, that Jesus said God was his father, and that he made himself equal with God. Jesus was claiming equality with God. And in John 10, for example, in verse 30, Jesus said, I and my father are one. So back in John chapter 5, uh, verse 33, no, I'm sorry, John 10, verse 33, the Jews say this, for a good work, we stone you not, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. They understood what Jesus was claiming. In 1 John 5, verse 20, John says this, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his Son, Jesus Christ, who is the true God. Can't be simpler than that. Now in verse 8, back in Hebrews, we continue, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He has an eternal th throne your scepter, the scepter is the symbol of rule. Your scepter is righteousness and is the scepter of your kingdom. The eternal throne and those, the one who sits on it is eternal forever and ever. And the son is identified as the eternal ruler, king. Powerful evidence from the very mouth of the father concerning the deity and the rule of Jesus Christ. He is the eternal king with an eternal kingdom, an eternal scepter of righteousness. He rules rightly and justly. He rules with a scepter of righteousness. We've been in submission to our governor, governing authorities in relation to 
the pandemic, COVID-19. Beloved, personally, I believe that our governor, Eric Holcomb, has had a very reasonable and just response for the most part to COVID-19. Some other governors have really used this crisis to make some uh, draconian rules, some even showing they're biased against conservatives and religion. I thank God for our governor's reasonable approach, but he's not a perfect ruler. But beloved, God the Father says that Jesus Christ will reign perfectly, righteously, justly. He rules with holiness, and, and this will be for all eternity. Now, in verse 9, the writer switches back to the Son as an incarnate being. He sees Jesus Christ that way. Look at verse 9 again. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. That's referring to his time on planet Earth. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Uh, Jesus Christ loved righteousness, hated iniquity. That's how he operated when he walked this planet. How many times in our Christian lives have we obeyed? We've done righteousness, but we didn't do it with joy. We did it out of obligation. Well, the writer here says that Jesus didn't have an unwilling condescension. He obeyed and he did so righteously and joyfully. In James chapter 1, 17, it says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights who is no, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Jesus Christ loved righteousness and, and there's no variation. Always just, always has been, always loved righteousness. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, <clears throat> excuse me, John says this, this is the message we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no, not darkness at all. He uses a double negative there. It's bad English, but it's terrific Greek, and it's used for making great emphasis. John is saying there's not any darkness at all in God in a very emphatic way. You ever been sitting on your sofa and the sunlight streams through your windows and falls on the couch beside you, the rays of light. And have you ever slapped your sofa where the rays of light fall? What happens? Well, no matter how clean your house is, suddenly the pure rays of light is filled with tiny specks of dust. What the Apostle John is teaching is that there is not one little speck of darkness in God. Jesus is God. There is not one little speck of darkness in Jesus Christ. He is total righteousness. The spring of everything Jesus did was his love for righteousness. Like the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Jesus Christ loved God, loved his word, loved righteousness. Now, naturally, because Jesus Christ loves righteousness, he hates anonomia, unrighteousness or lawlessness. You see, beloved, if you love God's right standards, you will hate the world's wrong standards. The two are, are inseparable, the love of the right and the hate of the wrong. 
I'm not talking about hating wrong people. I'm talking about hating unrighteousness. Uh, you cannot say that you love God, but you love sin. Now, most of us know that God says there is some joy for a season in sin. There is some enjoyment. But you can't go on like that. When you have a true love for God, there will be only true love for righteousness, and there will be hatred for sin. And, and when you fall into sin, you hate it. That's what God is saying. Jesus Christ never fell into sin. He hated sin. We see that in his temptation. We see it in his cleansing the temple. Uh, you see it in his death on the cross. And beloved, the more and more you and I become conformed to Jesus Christ, the more and more we're going to love God's word and love God's truth and God's righteousness, and the more and more we're going to hate sin. You can pretty well tell how close you are to being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ by your attitude towards righteousness and your attitude towards sin. Most of us followers of Christ would agree that we need to love righteousness more and we need to love sin less. May God help us to do that. But Jesus Christ, he loves righteousness and in the last part of verse 9 comes a direct statement of his superiority to angels. God says, God, even God, your Father has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, most commentators think that word companions has to do with the disciples or men or believers. But that's not the flow of the passage. It means associates. It, it means uh, an, uh, uh, an association of being together. And I think the point that the writer is making is that Jesus Christ is better than his companions, his associations, his associates that he created, his angels. Jesus Christ is greater than his companions. Uh, that's a clear statement, that Jesus is better than angels. Couldn't be more clear. And the writer says that God has anointed him better. Now, not everybody gets anointed. In fact, only kings got anointed, our prophets. So Jesus is a prophet, but here he's talking about his rule. So Jesus is anointed by God the Father. He's put on the eternal throne. He is superior to the angels. He is the eternal king. Jesus was God's anointed. And he was anointed with the oil of gladness. I personally believe that what we're going to see is when Jesus Christ receives his final coronation, coronation as king of the universe, after the great tribulation, when we're all gathered together, what a wonderful time that will be when Jesus is crowned as king of the universe. Uh, at that time, God is going to exalt him and give him a name above every name, and every knee shall bow and every a uh, tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord forever and ever. I, I believe that's what's going to happen. It's true that he has assumed his uh, kingly rule right after his ascension, but not every knee bows right now. Ultimately, every knee will bow. God hasn't really brought together his kingdom yet, but someday soon he will. And we will see Jesus Christ is greater than the angels because he is the son, because he is God, and because he is king. And number four, Jesus is greater than angels because he is the creator. Look at verse 10 and through 12. 
They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment. And like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also change. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Here the Holy Spirit quotes Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, to show that Jesus Christ is better because he is the eternal creator. Verse 10 is a tremendous verse. God is talking to Jesus, and he says, You, Lord, in the beginning. You, Lord, in the beginning. If he was in the beginning, he was existing before the beginning. He must have been before the beginning, which makes him without beginning. And then he laid the foundation of the earth. To create in the beginning, he must have been before the beginning and thus without beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And we later learned that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ was in the beginning, already there. Now it says here in verse 10 that he in the beginning, that is Christ, laid the foundation of the works and the heavens are all the works of his hands. If he created all that and he created the angels, he is greater than them because he is the creator. Now in verse 11, it says they shall perish. That is not the angels per se, but all that he created, uh, the heavens and the earth, they shall perish. And Peter tells us how. They will melt away with fervent heat, 2 Peter 3. They're going to perish. And the Lord's going to create a new heaven and new earth. They shall perish, but you remain. The creation will perish in the second, um, in the second judgment that talk, that's talked about in Revelation. They're going to perish, but not just but not Jesus Christ. They're all going to become like an old garment, all the creation. Uh, last week, I noticed that in a, my favorite pair of jeans, one of my favorite pair of jeans, that the knees have become very thin, worn, and in fact, one had a hole in it. My wife said, well, that's just a sty style now, Mike. Well. I'm such a Philistine when it comes to fashion. I think they're worn out. And now they have become work jeans rather than dress jeans. Uh, they have become work pants. Uh, and sometime they'll become so soiled and worn out, I'll roll them up and throw them away. I won't even give them to goodwill. Well, that's what God's saying will happen to the created universe. One day it'll be rolled up and thrown away like an old garment. But not Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God contrasts the passing of the temporal with the eternal Son, Jesus Christ. Everything folds up. All that looks so permanent to us right now, that's all going to be rolled up and discarded. Creation comes and creation goes. Men come and men go. Worlds come and worlds go. Stars burn and burn out. Angels are even subject to being imprisoned. The fallen angels, they're, they're not going to be in an eternal state of bliss. But Jesus Christ never changes, and he's not subject to change. He is not subject to alteration. He is eternally the same, and thus he is superior because he is the Son, because he is God, because he is King, and because he is Creator. Now, verse 13 and 14 gives us the final reason that Jesus is greater than angels. The writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 13 and 14. 
But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And they not all, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? This is the seventh Old Testament quote by the writer of Hebrews in chapter one. And it's from Psalm 110.1. It's a messianic psalm, and it claims full superiority of Jesus Christ as Messiah. He presents the destiny of Jesus as opposed to angels. In verse 13, God says, or the writer says, to which angel did God say, I'm going to make your enemies a footstool? Again, a messianic psalm to no angel, but this is the destiny of Jesus Christ. The just destiny of Jesus Christ is to be the universe's Messiah. All his enemies will be his footstool. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, things above the earth and on the earth and under the earth. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Messiah, Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, in God's plan, is destined to be the ruler of the universe and, and everyone and everything that inhabits it. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23, we read that every man in his own order it's talking about the resurrection. Christ the first fruits. After they, afterwards, they that are Christ that is coming. Again, talking about the resurrection. And then Paul says, then comes the end. What happens at the end? Paul says, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till all his enemies are under his feet. Again, the rule of the Messiah. And then verse 25 and 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he's put all things under his feet. And down in verse 28, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto the Father, all things under him, that God may be all in all. In the eternal relationship of the Son to the Father, the Son lives in subjection to the Father. Not that he is inferior, that would be blasphemous, but in his sonship, he has placed all kingdoms, all authorities, all powers of the world in subjection, not only to him as the Messiah, but then he brings them all in submission to the Father. When is that going to happen? It happens in the last times. It happens at his second coming. It happens when he comes in glory. Let me just read two verses from Revelation chapter 19, verse 15 and 16. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. The destiny of Jesus Christ is the eternal reign as the Messiah. In verse 13, uh, back in Hebrews, God says he will sit. And no time do you ever find God saying to the angels, sit. No, because they are dynamic creatures. They are uh, sent to accomplish the will of the king, uh, the will of the Messiah. Jesus sits down on the throne and issues orders. He reigns. That is the destiny. The destiny of the angels is in verse 14. Uh, and are they not all ministering spirits and sent forth by Jesus, the ruler, to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Jesus, 
reigns as the Messiah. That's his destiny. Angel's destiny is to serve him, and they keep serving him. And one of the greatest servants they have is to minister to the heirs of salvation. That's us. What a great promise. The angels are sent by Jesus Christ, the king, to minister to you and me. You, you say, what are they going to do for us? Well, I really don't know everything. The Bible is doesn't say everything. But some of the things angels do is they protect us from temporary danger. Danger. That was back true back in the Old Testament. Second Kings six tells about Elisha and his servant, and they were surrounded by the men of Assyria. They were menaced, men are being attacked, menaced by the king of Syria, and poor Elijah and his servant. They they were surrounded. They didn't have any way of defending themselves. But listen to what Elijah says. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, and a host encompassed the city, both with horses and chariots, his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The servant is scared. He's shaking in his sandals, not boots. Uh, man. He says, there's Syrians everywhere. The whole city is surrounded. And Elijah answered and says, fear not, for they who are with us are more than they who are with them. And the servant's looking around. I don't see him. So Elijah prays and he says, Lord, I pray you open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire around Elijah and his servant. Those were the army of God. Those were angels. Angels protected Elijah, Elisha and his servant and delivered them from danger. Remember how the angels dragged a lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, remember how the angels came and shut the mouth of the lions uh, in the lion's den when Nebuchadnezzar threw Daniel in there? Uh, the destiny of angels is not to rule, but to serve, and especially to serve believers. I've told this story before. I was standing at a gas station. My dad was alive at that time and he and Sherry and I had just received word from my sister-in-law that if we wanted to see my brother who was very sick alive we should leave uh, we picked up dad went to the gas station to fill up uh, here in Rochester my wife went inside the uh, filling station to get us a drink for the road so to speak and as I was pumping gas, I got a text from my sister-in-law. She said, Mike, Perry just passed away. I began to weep uncontrollably. My wife was still inside, my dad was in the car. I stood there by the back of the 300 just weeping uncontrollably. From an aisle over, a man came. He threw his arms around me and he said, what's going on? Can I pray for you? I, I said, my little brother has just died. And he held me in strong arms and he prayed for me. I've never seen him since. I think I would recognize him if I did. But I remember the first time that I told that in church that one of my dear friends said, Pastor, that was probably an angel. I don't know if he was a heavenly messenger or an earthly messenger, but this I know. He ministered to me at a time when I needed ministered to. 
when I needed comfort. I thank God for that time. Verse 14 says, Are angels not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The fourth of the original Greek is that the angels are, are per perpetually sent out to help God's people one after another. This is a familiar story perhaps to some. Uh, John Patton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands. And one night, hostile natives surrounded the mission state station. They were intent on burning out the Pattons and killing them. Patton, his wife, his family, prayed during that terror-filled night that God would protect them, that God would deliver them. It was a long night. When daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers were gone. A year later, the chief of that very tribe that was attacking the Patons came to know Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Remembering that night, Patton asked the chief what had happened, what kept him from attacking their house, burning down the mission station, and killing them. The chief replied in surprise, who were all those men that were with you? Patton knew there were no one, no men present with him and his family. But the chief said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords encircling the mission station. What an outstanding story. And I could give you from my files countless illustrations of how angels have been sent by the Son, the Messiah, the King, the Creator, God, to minister and to protect his followers. Every angel in that story, every account that you hear of those powerful beings who protected us are sent by one who is more powerful. They're sent from the throne room of God and Jesus Christ is sitting on that throne. Jesus Christ's destiny is to reign. He is better than angels. So we find then that the Son of God is superior to angels in every way. And in every one of these five superiorities, Christ is confirmed as superior from an Old Testament passage. Jesus is Messiah. He is God in flesh. He is the mediator of a new covenant, better than the old. And just think back for a minute, will you, upon chapter 1 of Hebrews. In this, this little brief 14-verse chapter, we have seen the deity of Christ established by divine names. He is called Son, Lord, God, by divine works. He is creating, sustaining, governing, uh, redeeming, purging sin uh, by ruling, by divine attributes. He is omniscient, omnipotent, unchanging, eternal, by divine worship. All of these things take place in chapter one. What a wonderful savior is Jesus our Lord. In chapter two, in verse three, the writer says, how shall we escape if we neglect such great salvation? Jesus is the son, Jesus is God, Jesus is king. Jesus is creator. Jesus is Messiah. And remember from last week's message, he is the firstborn of the dead. Jesus Christ was the protocos, the firstborn risen from the dead. Today in our service, we celebrate Easter. 
we celebrate that he is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy resurrection, my dad, my beloved. May God bless you. Happy Easter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the superior, superiorities that we've learned uh, from this chapter last week and again today. Thank you that we're not worshiping a human religious leader. We're not worshiping just some ethical teacher. We're worshiping Jesus Christ, who is God, the creator. And to think that he lives within us and the person of the spirit empowers us, loves us with a personal love, cares about us, sends his angels to minister to us and to protect us. And Father, these things overwhelm us. But God has presented all these truths of Jesus Christ here in chap Hebrews chapters one. My heart shudders and shakes to know that there are some people who will turn away and walk away neglecting such wonderful salvation. So Father, we pray that you would change any heart that it would be like that today. May they come to you by the wooing of your spirit. May they open their heart to receive Jesus Christ as their savior today. May they do that right now, no matter whether where they are, whether they're here in our services or there in the privacy of their own home, wherever they stumble across this video, may they accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior. May they ask him into their heart. And Father, for those of us who are believers, may we see him all the more beautiful because what we've learned, what we've seen, from the writer of Hebrews chapter one. May we be better equipped to witness for Christ with more power and more boldness because we know him who is the son, who is God, who is king, who is creator, who is Messiah. Bless us as we call, close. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.